Today on New Age to New Heart, we're answering your questions. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Doreen Virtue, and I'm an ex-New Age teacher. Hi, I'm Jen Misa, and I'm an ex-psychic. Hi, I'm Jack Marino Chen, and I'm an ex-occultist. And, and this, this is, is New Age to New Heart. Welcome back to New Age to New Heart. We're so excited for this special episode. I can't believe it's already our 10th episode where we'll be answering the questions that you have sent in. And as usual, I'm joined by my dear sisters, Jen Niza. Hey. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and Doreen Virtue. Hello. Great to be with you. Wait. <laughs> what was that word I said? Grand. With Great an and glad. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and today... We're just going to jump into it so we can get to as many questions as we can. And Dee, I'll ask you first. The first question is, how do you, quote, hear the Holy Spirit versus the demonic voices that we previously listened to? Basically asking, having come out of a world listening to demonic voices, how do you listen to the Holy Spirit now? Yeah, that's a great question because you're right, Jack. We thought we were hearing the voice of angels or spirit guides or something that's not biblical called the higher self. And I I actually thought I was hearing from the Holy Spirit because I was a student of A Course in Miracles, which teaches the Holy Spirit wrong, uh, unbiblically. So let's just start with the basics. Who is the Holy Spirit? When Jesus ascended, he, he sent God's Spirit. This is the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said in John 14, 26, that the Holy Spirit is the helper with a capital H, whom the Father, capital F, will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit is our teacher, and he is there to pray for us. The, the Bible teaches us all the things. It's a big, long list that the Holy Spirit does for us. And what we have to remember is that the Holy Spirit, when we're saved, is indwelling. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it's one of the reasons that the Bible commands us, exhorts us to glorify God in all things that we do because the Holy Spirit is within us. So we can't be messing around with paganism anymore. But the Holy Spirit does speak to us, but not like we thought in the New Age where it was an audible voice. If you hear an audible voice, it's I mean, God is God. It's possible for him to do anything. But be careful because those audible voices were what got us into trouble in the new age. Um, test the spirit. First John 4, 1 tells us that any spirit that uh, is of God will confess Jesus biblically. Now, John was talking to Gnostics who were claiming that Jesus only re resurrected as a spirit. So it's in that context, but it's applicable to us today to test the spirit. But I would just highly recommend don't try to hear a voice. I get so many letters from people who think that God's not talking to them because they don't hear a voice. And look, if you're hearing voices, I would get on your knees and pray fervently for God to stop those voices. That's what I did. It worked. God answered that prayer. I don't get those visions or hear those voices anymore. Instead, the Holy Spirit, as the indwelling spirit, speaks to us through steering us. That's that's the way it seems. It's He steers us by convicting us of our sins, and it comes across as something called godly sorrow. So Christians do sin. In fact, John, the apostle, said if we say we don't sin, we're actually lying because we still get sinful thoughts. We don't do them wantonly or unrepentantly like we did before we were saved, but we still get thoughts, maybe lust or anger, or uh, you, you dishonor your parents, or maybe you are tempted to tell a lie. And those sinful thoughts is basically what we're repenting about every day. So worldly sorrow is when you're afraid you're going to get caught or your reputation will be ruined. That's not biblical. That's not from the Holy Spirit. Godly sorrow is from the Holy Spirit that makes us grieve that we have sinned or are thinking of sinning and steers us back. We hear the Holy Spirit, and I'm putting here in quotes because it's not the literal audio. It's it's understanding the Holy Spirit reminding us of what Jesus taught through reading the Bible. The whole Bible is God-breathed, uh, and it's in 2 Timothy 3.16 that says it's it's um, the Holy Spirit is the word that's used. 
that the Holy Spirit breathed all of the Bible, all the scripture, through the human authors. And because the Holy Spirit's the author of the Bible, when you're reading it, the author is right there with you. It's amazing. And so he'll do something called illuminate passages when you're reading, because the Bible is living and active. And and the Bible will show you your sins. You know, sometimes people complain about the Bible. Well, it's got incest in it. It's got slavery. It's got rape. As if that's not God endorsing those things. It's the Holy Spirit showing us what's in the human's hearts after the fall of Genesis 3. You can read it there. And the fallen nature of all of us, even after we're born again, we have that fallen nature, that fleshly desire, uh, the world's influences, Satan's influences, they're still there. And the Holy Spirit's there to steer us away from those influences and put us back in God's word, the Bible, which we need to be reading every single day. With You guys, we can't live this crazy dark world without the guardrails of the Bible. And as you're reading the words of the Bible, you're actually hearing God's voice. You're, you're, you're hearing his voice through his words that he gave to us. The Bible's sufficient. We do not need to go outside of it for some secret wisdom, some hidden codes in the Bible. They don't exist. The The scroll is open. Everything we need to know is right there that the Bible gives us. So get yourself a copy of the Bible and a good translation. I personally like the New Living tra- uh, Translation for brand new Christians. Um, I don't read that now because you know I'm more um, used to reading the Bible every day. Uh, I also like the New King James Version Bible. I really like that translation. The Christian Standard Bible is a blend of formal and dynamic translations. Uh, it's The CSB is very easy to understand and very um, uh, authentic, and is it mirrors what the earliest manuscripts of the Bible said. You know that the Bible is in the 90% uh, accurate, in terms of being what the oldest manuscripts had. And so in the New Age, we're taught that the Bible is corrupted or missing books. Do some research. That's not true at all. That's just the devil not wanting you to listen to the Holy Spirit through reading the Bible. Amen, Dee. That's so helpful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And for our next question, this one I'm going to pass over to Jen. It is, why are there more trials after becoming a believer? Or in this case, the question was specifically asking, why are there more trials after getting baptized? Jen, can you speak to that? Sure. It'd be my pleasure to. I'm just getting my scriptures here. If you give me one second, because I don't have my glasses on, forgive me. But I would like to start with Ephesians six twelve. that there is a spiritual battle going on. And we talk about that quite often, especially in regards to the topics that we are. That we are I never look at the camera. I'm sorry. But we don't we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, the Bible says. We we wrestle against the principalities, I'm paraphrasing, the cosmic powers, the darkness, and the authorities in the high places or heavenly places. There is an actual battle going on. And the enemy seeks to uh oppress the Christian. I want you to think about this for a second. We now, we've all been saved out of the grip of the devil, but now we serve Jesus Christ. And the devil doesn't want us evangelizing, sharing the gospel, right? Uh, Going out there and testifying to who God is. The enemy does not want us to uh, help other people and bring to light that which is in the darkness, that which is his kingdom. Now, there are other reasons also for attacks. Uh, some of those may be to get us to believe a false gospel. There are people that go to churches with, uh, unfortunately, prosperity gospel, word of faith, um, charismania, things like that, because the enemy wants to confuse, wants to afflict, wants to get you away from God, wants to get you away from Jesus. Now, we know the truly saved person, the born-again believer, cannot be plucked out of Jesus' hand, which is the good news, of course. However, that doesn't mean that the enemy isn't going to continue to try. Now, the other reasons for trials and... Did they say trials, Jack? I'm sorry. Yes. Was that part of it? Well, we're going to have trouble in this world. Trials are a part of that. I can't say that you're necessarily going to have more trials, although the Christian... uh, 
is so set apart from the world. So maybe it is, it's in a different way, the trials, because unbelievers face trials as well. Jesus said, in this world, we'll have trouble, but take heart. He's overcome the world. Uh, we'll go through things that will increase our faith. I hate to say like a testing of our faith, but it does because uh, where are we going to turn to? Who are we depending upon? We need to come to God solely for that, right? And it really will strengthen your faith. Even the things like sleep paralysis, and if you go through something, these demonic attacks, which we've all gone through as uh, Christians, uh, you know, again, I, I really believe the enemy has wanted to, in my personal life, keep me down, isolate me, get me upset, get me anxious, get me depressed at times. He will use anybody and anything to try to destroy you. But as a believer in Christ, he cannot destroy us. That's the good news. But let me tell you something. It's very temporary because what do we do? We put those spiritual uh, tools that we have in place and we pray to God and we read the Bible as Doreen encourage you guys to do. And I echo that. Please be in the word of God every single day. I have so many. Second Corinthians uh, 10, uh, three to six. I encourage you to read that, that this is a spiritual battle going on. I mentioned Ephesians 6, 12. That's the reality of it. But we have spiritual weapons to use. Praying, reading the Bible, right? Uh, submitting before the Lord, being obedient to the Lord, confessing our sins because our own sin is also a, pro a huge problem, a huge enemy and leaves us vulnerable, vulnerable for these attacks of the evil one. Um, sometimes also, uh, if you remember the book of Job, which if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read the Bible, of course, again. But the devil was allowed to afflict Job. And Job did not sin. And that is not what happened that led to these attacks of the devil. There was a conversation uh, on the, in the spiritual realm going on that Job never knew about between God and the devil. And God allowed the devil to afflict Job. Of course, his buddies, not so great, were very accusatory uh, of Job, saying it was his sin that caused it, but of course it was not. And Job proved to be faithful and righteous to God. And like I said, uh, it, I know it sounds, and I hate to use this word, counterintuitive. Why would the Lord allow you to go through something uh, from the devil? that leads to strengthening your faith. God is well within his authority to do that. And I have been through so many spiritual attacks, trials since coming to Christ. I wouldn't I wouldn't take what, it's gonna sound weird, I wouldn't take any of them back because I have grown so close to the Lord. It amps up my faith to a new level each and every time and uh, and I just would want to encourage you that if you are facing demonic attacks, oppression, it's only temporary. And remember also, as a child of God, every suffering here is temporary. This is all going to pass us by. We are going to be in heaven in glory with Jesus Christ, a place with no suffering, a place with no tears. That's our future. That is our hope that we can rely upon and depend upon. So I really hope that helps, and I hope it answered the question. Thank you so much, Jen. I think that was so helpful. I appreciate that. The next question is, I'll answer this one. It's basically the book of Enoch. What is it? And should slash can I read it? So to answer the first question, the book of Enoch is pseudepigrapha. So that's basically a fancy word for saying it's a phony um, it's it literally means to write falsely. So it's someone pretending to be someone that they're not and pretending to write as them. So this specific work is it talks a lot about angels, demons, the Nephilim. It talks about the coming judgment. So that's what it is. And we know who it, it's referring to Enoch, um, who is spoken of in Genesis 5. This is what we know about about the Enoch that this writing is pretending to be. It says, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Now, the question of should 
slash can I read the Book of Enoch? Well, I once heard, I think it was Todd Friel, say when answering a question similar to this, go ahead and read the Book of Enoch as soon as you have gotten every single thing that you can get out of the Bible, which you will never do in this lifetime. And his point was that we have all things pertaining to life and godliness the Lord has given us in the Bible. We have um, what we need to live a life of godliness, to obey God. We have the commanded will of God. It's the inspired word of God. It's God's word to us. And the book of Enoch is not. And so it's important to know God's word. And, and I can speak from experience. Works like the book of Enoch can be distracting from God's word. And so another thing to, to look at is because it's, it's falsely attributed work, it's not actually written by Enoch. It, it's, the premise is a lie. It's per, the work is pretending to be someone that it's not, which is already concerning. But what's cool is that if you want to know what is real in the book of Enoch, Jude actually, the book of Jude in the Bible actually quotes from the book of Enoch in Jude verses 14 and 15, where it says, it was also about these that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the godly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And the book of Jude is dealing with false teachers. And so it's cool that if, you, if you're interested in the book of Enoch, we know that that portion of it is true because it's in the inspired word of God. And I love what John MacArthur says when addressing this. He says, since Jude was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and then he cites 2 Timothy 3.16, as Doreen did earlier, and 2 Peter 1, verses 20 to 21, and, in, and since, while writing under the Holy Spirit, he included material that was accurate and true in its affirmations, he did no differently than Paul. Basically saying that we know that this part of the book of Enoch is true because Jude shared it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And yet Paul also did this. He, in instances, would quote, in two instances, a Greek, um, a Greek philosopher, or really a, a Greek. Did you see that? Yeah, you had some balloons going on behind you. It's your birthday, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> it's your birthday. Hey. <laughs> what happened? You had balloons coming in front of then, you. It was so cool. How did that happen? Because you talked about Greek philosophers. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> I am uh, great. Do, 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 Where's do, do, the WD okay. frog? Do, do. Yes. That, okay, cool, cool. Um, <laughs> so Paul quoted from the Greek poet, um, and he did so in Acts 17 and Titus 1. And then he also shared a Greek proverb by Menander in 1 Corinthians 15. And that's the one that I'll, I'll look at really quick. Because it's interesting how Paul wasn't affirming that everything that these um, poets or, or these people said was true, but that these statements are, he's affirming as true. And so in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33, it says, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. And that quote, bad company ruins good morals, is actually quoting from a Greek proverb. So all that to say, if you want to know what's true in the book of Enoch, we can look at the word of God and look at Jude. But as a general encouragement, I would encourage you to focus on the word of God, especially if you're a new believer, especially if you're coming out of the new age. There's a lot of occult um, teachings that are tied to the book of Enoch. It can be very dangerous to get these ideas in your head and then kind of separate them from what is reality in truth in God's word and what is fiction, what is not true. Um, so just to protect yourself from lies, I think it's important to to ground yourself in the word of God and and be more focused on getting everything that you can out of God's word rather than going to pseudepigraphical texts. Um, and also I not I don't the chosen it kind of reminds me of the chosen how there's so much that is not true about bible characters about bible stories in there that it kind of gets hard to separate what you remember okay what is true and what is biblical but now I have these things for me the book of Enoch was similar when I was in the occult that when I read it it's their bible characters it's 
biblical themes, but it's not biblical and trying to pull out the tentacles of all that in your mind. Just be in the word of God. That's all that you need. That's where God speaks to you. Um, and again, if you're interested in the book of Enoch, you can go to the book of Jude and and study the book of Jude and what is true from, from that text. So I hope that's helpful. Jack, thank you so much for talking about this. Just real quick. Mm, yeah. Um, just stay. Here's your bean. This is my bean. Um, just stay away from the book of Enoch. As Jack said, it, it leads to obsessions. I find that people who are into the book of Enoch get all obsessed with watchers and ETs and mm-hmm. Nephilim. And that takes your eyes off of Jesus. Absolutely. And for that reason, even though he's he was a friend of mine and I used to promote him, stay away from Michael Heiser's work. <laughs> I know he's got a resume that's amazing, but he was obsessed with ETs and watchers and Nephilim and people who become his fans and Enoch fans. You just you can't take your eyes off Jesus. Yes. And the real Enoch in the Bible is amazing. It's okay to love that Enoch, but this Enoch or this person pretending to be Enoch, that it's again, yes, fix your eyes on Jesus. Thank you, D. And D, I have another question for you. Great. Yay. Um, Do I get balloons too? I don't know why that happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, D, what are the dangers of grounding exercises of acupuncture or other holistic remedies? What's so dangerous about them? So I get these questions a lot about alternative ways of dealing with health issues and health concerns, and I understand them. Most people who've listened to this podcast probably have heard me say that I'm not a big fan of big pharma or Western medicine. I think it's got its place for sure. Um, But after dealing with my mother and my father um, going through their end of life medical issues, and my mother in particular being very misdiagnosed in a dangerous way that put all of us at danger because she had a very contagious um, condition that wasn't diagnosed till the end. Um, I, I actually think that there's a place for alternative medicine. I'm not this hardliner that says, you know, no, you can only go to Western medicine. But we need to be wise because there's pitfalls. And one of the pitfalls of, let's start with acupuncture, since the question asked a few of them. Acupuncture is rooted and grounded in Taoism, Chinese Taoism. Now, for those who are not familiar with John 14.6, which which Jesus, as recorded uh, by the apostle closest to him, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, meaning no salvation, no heaven, no relationship with God except through Jesus, the co-eternal, co-equal second person of the Holy Trinity. And so when we go outside of Jesus to these other philosophies and religions, there's pitfalls that are potential there. We're talking about the potential of being exposed to uh, polytheism, Uh, Most of these Eastern religions have multiple deities. And I went to an acupuncture and there was Hindu and Buddhist statues all over. Uh, And so the acupuncturist was using a a blend of different modalities and new age teaching concepts. So going to an acupuncture itself, if it was not spiritual, I would say, yeah, take a look at that. Um, But usually there's, it's like going to a yoga studio. There's all this other Uh, deception going on that that you get inculcated into. So be very aware that I actually got no benefit personally from acupuncture when I went for allergies. Um, Zero, zero help. I know some people are going to say, well, it helped me. You know, I understand there's definitely some of these modalities can help. They didn't help me. So I don't even think they're effective. I personally would not go to an acupuncturist today. Grounding or earthing is another question I get all the time. And you guys, this just cracks me up because going barefoot, when did we have to come up with some cutesy marketing term for it? Oh, it's grounding. Oh, it's earthing. I mean, it's it's going barefoot on the ground, which, yes, that's comforting. That's helpful. <laughs> Being outside in nature, I think, is relaxing. I think it's really important for us. You know, God declares his glory through the stars, through the nature. He's the creator, though. We have to go to Romans one twenty five, which says that we cannot serve or worship the creature, the creation, 
but only the creator with a capital C. So uh, earthing or grounding, let's call it what it is, going barefoot, can become an idol very quickly where people think, oh, this is what's helping me. It's the magical uh, properties of earthing. I've got this book on it. I've taken a class on it. You don't need to take a class on taking your shoes off. This is just getting crazy. You know, it just, it just cracks me up, like how we have to make everything a fad. Um, uh, also, we want to make sure that we don't engage in pantheism when we are mm-hmm. getting involved with uh, going outside in nature and enjoying it. So God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. So he is there in nature. That's his creation. But we can't make the ground or a rock or a crystal or a tree into an idol. That's where we get into trouble is idolatry. So with all these alternative methods, I would pray for God's wisdom. God did give us these uh, things to heal us with, including prayer, including praying for wisdom. I'm a big uh, believer in, in preventative medicine through eating organic food that got whole foods, not this processed junk. Processed food is not what God made. He gave us fruits and vegetables and meat and and eggs and such. So, you know, I think if we would just follow what God gave us for food, a lot of the inflammation that can cause illnesses could be prevented. Thank you so much, Dee. And Jen, is it okay to spend time with my friends or my family who are involved in witchcraft or the new age? This is a question that came into us. Jack, thank you so much for asking me that question. I have heard that question multiple times before, and I'm actually uh, really passionate about this because at some point in time, you are going to uh, deal with people that are still in the new age, especially if you were in the new age yourself, coming out of that community. So do you just dump relationships? Do you just dump people? I cannot encourage you to just some people or stop relationships, specifically if they're family members. However, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.33, which Jack uh, stole from me before. No, I'm only kidding. (laughs) And see. 1 Corinthians 15.33, which Jack did steal from me earlier, and I'm leaving that part in there. No, she didn't steal it. It's God's words. We can all use it. It's available to all of us does say that bad company corrupts good morals. So I want to go here for a couple of reasons. One, if you're spending time around somebody who's in the new age or witchcraft, uh, firstly, you need to understand that they are directly serving the devil. They are communicating with demons and they are oppressed by demons and on the road to possible possession, even though it's rare. You have the shield of faith. You're a Christian. You're a born-again believer. Should you really be around somebody with this complete demonic presence, demonic presence around them? I would warn you. I would give you a serious warning on that. What I would do is I would share the gospel. I would share God's word about divination. Read to them, please, between Deuteronomy 18, uh, 10 to 12, which was a huge passage for each of us here. Uh, But God is clear from the beginning of his word to the end of his word throughout his word that he condemns divination, that it's an abomination to him. And you want to point that out to your loved ones and your friends. You want to share truth with them because you love them and you care about their souls. Uh, Having said that, uh, you you, you know that there's a spiritual battle. As I mentioned uh, at the top of this program, we were talking about that. So... You don't want to put yourself in that path, my friends. You really don't. So I would honestly caution you and pray that you would limit your interaction with people that are practicing witchcraft and people that are in the new age. Uh, And I really encourage you to pray for those people. Please be in prayer and also pray to God before you enter into a conversation with them. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the right words to say. Ask God to give you openings, to open doors for you to have the conversation. I never say beat somebody over the head with the Bible. That may not be the way to, well, not the way to reach anybody. You're not going to physically beat anybody over the head with the Bible. But you know what I mean. Uh, Coming at somebody, you know, just shooting out verses, sometimes those people may feel, I think Doreen's laughing. I'm going to just not look. 
it's not even peripheral. I can kind of see her. See, now I'm looking at the camera. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> but um, anyway, pray for these people. Oh, beating people over the head with the Bible. You Sometimes people just will feel like you're using the J word, judging them, coming down on them. They're going to think, oh, there's Miss Christian. She thinks that she's better than me and, and whatever else. And we're not better than anybody. We're sinners that acknowledge that we need a savior and uh, praise God, receive the free gift of salvation. And like I said, please be in prayer for your friends, your loved ones, your family members. My caution, I wrap it up with this, just to limit the time that you spend and don't engage certainly with anything that they're doing. Remember this, 1 Peter 5, 8 says that Satan prowls around uh, like a lion seeking to whom he may devour. Satan is the tempter, my friends, and the father of lies. So if something's going on in your life, you have anxiety, you're vulnerable, you're insecure, and now you're at lunch with your good old ex, um, the new age buddy, there might be something that they're going to say that could tempt you back into your past or tempt you into doing something that is completely against God. And I have to caution you to stay away from that. Thank you so much, Jen. That's so helpful. That actually reminds me of a, a verse at the end of Jude talking about the snatching people out of the fire. It tells us how to deal with these people and have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. So Jen, thank you so much. That's so helpful. And this next question is in regards to exposing darkness. How much darkness is okay to expose? Is there a limit? And is there a risk or danger of getting sucked into it all out of curiosity? So this is a great question. And my first response would be to ask you, the person who asked this, the question of, are you in the word? Are you in prayer? Are you in fellowship with other believers? What is your walk with the Lord like? Um, and then are you in the word more than you are studying darkness or, uh, as you said, exposing darkness? How much are you in God's word? How much are you filling your mind with what is true? And I think that there's a really big difference between studying the word of God and seeing what God says about darkness and how he equips us in his word to to fight darkness, to fight spiritual forces and these topics that are often exposed versus studying the world to understand the darkness going on in the world and and all those things. I think there's a big difference between the two. So my question would be, what are you filling your mind with? Is it the word of God or is it are you just being inundated with the world and the darkness in it? And what comes to mind for me is really Romans 11 to uh, through 11, or I'm sorry, really Romans 11 through Romans 12. Um, but for time's sake, I'll just read from Romans 12 verses um, 1 and 2. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And another thing that comes to mind, especially if you were saved out of, for example, new age darkness, or you were saved out of these things that that you desire to expose, so important. Um, my husband reminded me of First Peter 1, verses 13 to 21, which is kind of long, but Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being so reminded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So fixing our eyes on Christ as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. So if you're coming out of um, the, the darkness of the new age, for example, be really on alert, be watchful that in exposing it, in diving into it, 
you're not just being conformed to your former um, passions. It's it's really important to be aware of where you're at. And then I think of also we're called to be doers of the word. So as you're in the word, are you are you a hearer who forgets? Or are you a doer who acts as James 1 talks about? And then I'll just speak from my personal experience. Personally, what's helpful for me is I stick to what I came out of. So I've had people ask me like, oh, what do you think about Bigfoot or like other things that are popular at this time? (laughs) And for me personally, at least maybe this will change one day, but where I'm at, my heart, what the Lord has put on my heart is exposing what I came out of, is exposing the darkness that the Lord saved me out of. And um, I don't find a need to go into the and and learn about all these other dark things. That, that's just what I believe the Lord has led me to do. And I want to always ask myself, am I remembering or or dwelling in what I came out of more, more than I'm in the word of God, more than I am looking at the truth? Because it's so important that our minds are filled and saturated, that we um, that the word of Christ dwells in us richly. We want to be filled with the truth. Um, I think of Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 as well, that says, Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, as Doreen was talking about earlier, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. And so my last encouragement would be to ask the Lord, for wisdom regarding this. Check your heart. I love in Psalm 139, the prayer that says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the everlasting way, earnestly desiring for the Lord to lead you in what he would have you expose if that's what he's calling you to do, but but always seeking to be pleasing to the Lord. I love in Ephesians 5, it talks about um, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And then in other parts of the Bible, we make it our aim to please him. And so in whatever you're doing, making sure that you are primarily in the truth and in God's word again, and then asking the Lord to search your heart and and reveal your motives and reveal what is wise for you where you're at. Um, And he's so kind to, to give us wisdom. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, back to you, Dee. Last question for you today we have. Is it appropriate for a Christian to visit the local naturopath for, uh, in general or for bioresonance therapy? I personally don't know what that means, mm-hmm. but maybe you do. I do because um, Michael and I went through a lot of bioresonance therapy. And I have to say I would do it again in a heartbeat mm-hmm. because it was so helpful. But there's parameters here. Just like when I was talking about acupuncturists, there are naturopaths who are steeped in New Age, occultic, and Eastern philosophy and practices. So there's actually a Christian association of naturopaths. I would be looking there first. Um, And the two things that the naturopath really helped uh, Michael and I with was detoxing from parasites and from heavy metals. So our naturopath was not about philosophy, barely even talked, (laughs) just took us through chelation therapy because, you know, in life and we had fillings, he helped us to go to a good dentist to take out the metal fillings and and uh, because we have so many pets, and at that time we had a lot of horses and cows, we had a lot of parasites in us. So he helped us to safely learn how to cleanse because it turns out that a lot of illnesses are caused by parasites. And it's something that we can all do safely, like with diatomaceous earth, it's very you know non-toxic and cheap way to, to detox. Uh, and so I do believe going to a naturopath I would go to one before I'd go to a Western doctor, honestly, myself. But again, with those parameters, because you have to be so careful and you have to know the Bible and compare everything to the Word as the Bereans did in Acts 17, 11. Um, if your naturopath says, well, I also want you to meditate to this this audio and it's an Eastern meditation, or I want you to take this yoga class, that's where you're at the wrong place. I would either leave, go to a new naturopath, or just say, Thanks for offering, but I'm a Christian. I can't, and I can't mm-hmm. do that because it's not glorifying God. And maybe that's a way to um, evangelize to the naturopath. You never know. Um, but we also need to understand that it's not always God's will for us to heal. The yeah. health and wealth, prosperity, word of faith, false teachers, and the Christian science I grew up in uh, always want to say that if you just say the right word, say the right prayer, 
If there's a code or think the right way, you will automatically be healed. And they, they often twist Isaiah 53 when they say that the, the message in the Bible is that Jesus was crushed and his stripes and his wounds. We were healed by those. It doesn't mean that because you're a saved Christian that you will automatically be healed. That's absolutely not what this is about. I always go to 2 Corinthians 1.9, uh, which says, if Paul had, it lists all the things he went through and he says, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So uh, these trials we go through physically are can be a blessing or part of God's pruning process that he only does to those he loves that make us rely on him instead of ourselves. So that's super important when we look at these health concerns. Um, again, with naturopath, be wise because you don't want to get involved with anyone, including with a Western medical doctor. I shouldn't say that it's just the alternative medicines. These days, the regular MDs will sometimes prescribe mindfulness, which is Eastern meditation, not biblical meditation. They'll prescribe Qigong and Reiki and all these things that can lead you down the path of new age and occultism. So be wise, compare everything to scripture. Thank you so much, Dee. And Jen, your last question is um, submitted in, and it says, I am in a relationship with an unbeliever, and now I'm a Christian, and he's still an unbeliever. He's not judging me for finding God, but he is not on board. Do you have any advice? Hey, I'm so sorry that you're dealing with that, honestly. That must be so difficult for you. I just want to say, first of all, I'm so thankful that the Lord has saved you. And that is such a blessing. And praise God for uh, your salvation and that you are a sister in Christ now. That can be really uh, dismaying, very uh, uh, sad for you. Uh, but the thing is, we can't evangelize date or, you know, there's no evangelism dating where we believe that we can change somebody or... Of course, you can pray for this person. You want to pray for him. You want to pray that the Lord saves him. But at the end of the day, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And though he may be a really nice guy and you may think all these wonderful things about him, he right now is in bondage to sin. He is not a child of God. And that's what the Bible is talking about. You have the light of Christ and he does not right now. So I want to um, let you know that, uh, so the yoke, so oxen, they were put in this, the yoke, it's like these two circular pieces for their heads to go into and then the straight bar that connect the two circular pieces. And the oxen would be, you know, one through the head through that one, what I know this is terrible, one through the other one, which forces them to go in the same direction, which is being equally yoked. So you as a Christian, you love Jesus, you're going to keep his commands, right? That's what the Lord Jesus says. He says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And this, the first commandment that Jesus gives, which is not a new commandment, it fulfills the 10 commandments. And the second one, of course, is to love your neighbor. So you are wanting to please God and the unbeliever is not in the same position as you. So you can't possibly be equally yoked and going in the same direction. You're going to have a biblical worldview. You're going to see life. You're going to see all issues, family, money, children, travel, uh, so on and so forth. Of course, evangelism and things of that nature through that biblical lens and the unbeliever is not. And they're spiritually blind without Christ. They're not even going to understand what you're talking about. Merely agreeing to do some things doesn't save somebody. So I just want to mention also, I want to encourage you to go into Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 22. Okay. I'd like to read a little bit if it's okay. This is where um, the Lord is giving instructions to the married couple. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. 
Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing that she might be holy without blemish. I just want to ask you, how can an unbelieving husband do these things? He wouldn't even have the desire to lead you, to lead you in prayer, to lead you in devotion, to go to church with you, to care so much about your soul. He loves, He. loves. You want your husband to love God first and foremost. We can't love anybody else, like I just mentioned, until we love God. He can't be the godly husband that you need while being unsaved. And uh, I know that that's a, that might be a hard pill to swallow right now. And I'm, I'm asking you or encouraging you rather to go pray to the Lord, ask him for his wisdom. I think we mentioned that before. James 1.5 says we go to God and we ask for his wisdom and he will give it. And I just pray that we don't go back to the fear of man versus the fear of God. You want to please God, not man. And I know that means sacrificing many things, many things we leave behind, many things we have to give up, including sometimes people that we love. And I pray uh, with you, sister, that the Lord would save the person that you're with, but that you realize also that Jesus loves you so much you matter so much to the Lord. And I I really um, take this very seriously because I've been where you are. And I just, uh, I just pray that God would uh, save him and uh, bless you, sister. Thank you so much, Jen. And this is our last question. Is there popular worship music that is not biblical? Um, Yes, definitely. Sadly, very, very, very sadly. So my encouragement would be to test everything and compare it to scripture. If you're singing a worship song, I encourage you, read through the lyrics and ask yourself, is this true? Is this biblical? Something that I've realized lately is that a lot of the time it seems that songs try to be poetic at the expense of being true. And so it might sound really good. It might feel really good and be beautiful. But is that really true of the God that you're claiming to worship? Especially because this question isn't even Christian music. The question is explicitly popular worship music. Is that biblical? So if if we're worshiping God, we want to make sure that we're worshiping God and not uh, an idol and not some someone who we're describing who is not God because that's not true of God. And this conversation really does lump in Bethel, Hillsong, Elevation, those ministries that maybe one day we'll talk about more in length, but just to like briefly touch on that. There are there are music ministries that almost ex- exist or at least do point many people to churches that teach false doctrine, that teach Oftentimes, either water, very watered down truth, either just lies or, and sometimes truly heresy, destructive heresy. And so even though some of those songs, their lyrics might be true, looking at who is who is putting these songs out and and do, especially if we're thinking I'm, my brain goes to congregational worship, to worshiping in a church, leading that song in a church, um, is this... Is this something that is truly worshipful to God if it's coming from a ministry that is teaching lies about God? Really just trying to do the research, think that out, look at what these churches are preaching because we also don't want to point people to those ministries. Um, and I'm th- we talk about itching ears a lot, thinking about how these so- a lot of songs today sound really good. They feel good. They make me feel good. But is it true? Because if it's not, then we aren't actually worshiping God. Sometimes we're worshiping ourselves. Sometimes we're just singing what feels good to us. And so 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 to 5 says, The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. 
As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So I would, you know, my my question for you is, are you looking at these words, comparing them to scripture? You want to be a Berean. You want to really see, is this worshiping the God of the Bible or is this describing someone else entirely or is it just watered down to where it feels good? But I don't really know if this is even true. Um, and they're just, again, we spoke about this recently, but Second Peter speaks about false teachers following their sensuality and um, even talking about how these um, these false teachers, they creep in unnoticed and they exploit. And it's it's very dangerous because something that one of my pastors, Kyle Swanson, said is heresy is creeping into the church one step at a time through the music. And so it can be concerning that these songs that really sound good and they're beautiful and they're well done and so much money goes into the production and we love them, but... But is the, is it worship? Are we making songs that worship the true God? So not to <laughs> go on a tangent, but my encouragement would be for you to really ask yourself, looking at the words, looking at the worship song, is this just something that feels good or is this true? And in Matthew 7, I'm trying to figure out um, where it is. Jesus warns about um, you know false teachers and these things coming about. And it has the, you can tell a tree by its fruit verse, but it's just so important to remember, Jesus said that that false teachers would come and he tells us how they will come. And it's a, it is crazy how they are wolves in sheep's clothing. But beware of false prophets who come to you in <laughs> sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Where to be on alert, beware, be watchful and um a lot of the time, sadly, we do need to be watchful in music because those, a lot of those music ministries are pointing to churches who are perpetuating lies about the God that we love and serve. That's so true. And you being a worship singer yourself, Jack, you, you know this. And Michael and I, we went to Hillsong as new Christians because of their music. So Me too. it's efficient. You did too. And I, did. and I just want to quickly, I know I've used my one bean before, but I just want to quickly... Say you that can have mine, Dee. Oh, you thanks. can have mine. <laughs> there's a there's a support group that I'm part of on Facebook <laughs> called called there's a if you want to know what musicians are safe and which ones are apostate and such, um, come join us at Sound in Worship. And I don't know if you're in that group, Jack and Jen, but I would invite mm-hmm. you guys in there too. Sound in Worship, it, the the whole group was started to help delineate who's safe to listen to and who's um, pointing us in the wrong direction mm, so good and um just to clarify the bean thing i told <laughs> my dear sisters that they used to get one bean and if they want to chime in on someone else's question they can they can use that so <laughs> and jen's so thing. sweet gave me yes thank you jen Mwah. you're welcome i love you sis well we have <laughs> speaking of music we haven't heard from the wb frog today that's true hello the my baby dance. hello my darling Hello, my ragtime gal. The balloons did come through, though. So, <laughs> that- um, so we just want to thank you so much for submitting these questions. Maybe we'll do another Q and A in the future. So, maybe just every tenth episode, huh? I love that. Yes. Yeah, so please keep sending them in. We love hearing from you. And I also want to say, the New Heart family, we are so encouraged by you. We love you, and we're just so blessed to to have this community and even this fellowship on Mondays at noon Pacific Standard Time. um, And that's three Jen's time, New York time. And um, (laughs) And other people's too. (laughs) That's true. That's true. You have your own time zone, Jen. (laughs) Gee, thanks. We'll just call it Jen time. Yes. (laughs) It's 3 p.m. Jen time. (laughs) We really love that time. And it's very sweet. We're actually, as we're recording this, it's happening in about 55 minutes. So we'll all be there. Yeah. But join us. We love um, to connect with you. And all that being said, we love you. We're praying for you. And we will see you next week on New Age to New Heart. Bye. Yay. Bye. Jack, thank you so much for asking me that question. I... That's, that's... <laughs> do you remember that one? <laughs> Why did I get balloons? I just don't under. I'm still like in shock. You should be happy. I'm so jealous of the balloons. I want balloons. Yeah.